welcome to the seventh edition of Reclaiming My Mind. I am your host, Jessica Vaughn. I am also the president of the Democratic Progressive Caucus of Tampa Bay. Um, I'd like to thank all of our listeners for coming back. I know some of our podcasts are um, lengthy. Uh, so we're going to try to keep this one a little bit, <laughs> a little bit shorter. Um, but I would like to welcome um, our uh, guest, Debbie King. Welcome. Hi. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming out on a rainy night uh, to come and talk about something near and dear to my my heart, which is uh, universal health care or Medicare for all. We'll talk about the differences. But first, I'd love to hear kind of your background um, and you know what has you passionate um, about healthcare and kind of your journey here? Of course. Um, and before we get really started, mm-hmm. uh, I, uh, you know, because I come over from uh, like Seminole Heights area mm-hmm. and I was driving on to uh, on Bruce B. Downs mm-hmm. and my daughter was born at the university. Hospital, oh, Florida right? Hospital, I think it's called now, that right? It is called <laughs> Florida Hospital now. Mm-hmm. And um, I wanted to congratulate um Matt and uh, Stephanie on Oh, their yeah, that's right. Is, Stephanie Garza. Is, yeah, Sophia mm-hmm. is her Aww. name. So I wanted to say congratulations to so them. Sweet. My heart went a little faster when I drove past the hospital and I realized it was the same one my daughter was born Aww. in. <laughs> yep. So um, I know I've, uh, I've talked a little bit about my story before, mm-hmm. and thank you for asking. Mm-hmm. I've always been in a fa- – my family has always been very politically active. Oh. My dad was raised up in Philadelphia. Mm. And dad was a union guy. Uh, my mom came from Costa Rica where they have universal health care. <laughs> oh, okay. um, they don't even have a military there. So in, uh, in, two- in 2003, my youngest brother enlisted in the Army, and that's kind of – where I got started in like actual like activism, you know, mm. anti Iraq war activism, mm-hmm. um, fighting back against the lies that we are being told, you know, of the Iranian rods from mm-hmm. uh, Colin Powell and all that. And then um, I went into uh, teaching after I graduated um, from USF. And uh, in 2006, my dad was having a lot of financial problems. I was living up in Lutz. Um, and uh, he had come to live with me, mm-hmm. and uh, he, unfortunately, he was not able to afford his medication. He had a couple of issues. Mm-hmm. Um, he was in his late fifties. Um, he had uh, um, atherosclerosis, which is kind of like hardening of yeah. your arteries. Um, right. You know, so kind of like the beginning of heart disease, mm-hmm. and um, also um, diabetes. So it was me and my daughter and my my dad and spring break which was my first year teaching. And it was, you know, like, like your hardest year. Right? Oh, so hard. So, <laughs> it is. Um, <sighs> I was uh, sleeping in a little bit. It was like, I don't know, maybe like 8.50 or so. It was a little bit before 9 o'clock. And um, I, I felt like really good in that morning. I was like, wow, I can't believe I was able to oversleep so long. And in my living room, my dad was on my couch sitting up. Mm-hmm. And he was just no color in his skin. No. Um, ran to him. Um, he was cold. Uh, started doing CPR. I called 911. And the EMTs got there. And they put him on the floor, pushed out my um, coffee table, mm. um, ran him down to um, Carrollwood Hospital, which is on Dumb Avery, like just uh, south of Waters. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, um, That's got a my daughter. Journey. It was, we didn't have the um, hospital that on was the uh, Van Dyke one. then. Yeah, it was the closest one at the time. Because I lived on, uh, like, right near Van Dyke and Del Mabry mm-hmm. <clears throat> in Lutz. And uh, so um, got my daughter with my mom, ran down there, like, it was, like, so fast. And uh, when I got there, um, the doctors told me he had gone. Like, there was nothing they could do. Mm, so sorry. And thank you. Um, so one of the... One of the things I remember most is um, my younger sister and my younger brother getting to the hospital Mm -hmm. and seeing them realize when they saw my face. Right. And uh, so, I mean, it's uh, not an easy thing to go through. It's really hard, especially when you have to tell your, you know, six-year-old daughter. And she she really didn't understand at the time. Sure. Um, So at the time... Both my dad and I were working on 
Phyllis Bujanski's campaign for District 12, mm-hmm. federal um, for Congress, against uh, this new guy, Bill Arrakis. Mm. Um, his seat had been held for since the 80s, late 80s, by his dad. Mm. And uh, so Bill Arrakis is actually got elected and is currently in that seat and has been against expanding health care for folks um, since then, when my dad, you know, died in, in his district. Right. So um, <clears throat> I've been working on um, a lot of different social justice issues, but always, I always come back to healthcare. I went back in 2009 after Obama got elected, working on um, the Affordable Care Act. And uh, of course, we were all very upset when the Democrats caved and excluded the public option. Mm -hmm. Now that we have a lot of folks getting educated on the issue, and, you know, with Bernie Sanders getting it really widespread knowledge, mm-hmm. um, for the most part, we're seeing an opportunity. We're seeing an opportunity for folks um, getting more engaged in politics and understanding how it affects their everyday lives. Right. And so um, I'm really excited about all the conversation. And, and thanks again for having me on to talk about it, because there's so many thousands and thousands of people out there who've been through similar things. Right. Absolutely. Um, And it it brings me back to thinking about something that's so fundamental. And I'm so glad to see that it's become kind of a tagline for, you know, the movement is, you know, the the slogan that healthcare is a human right, Mm -hmm. um, which I think frames it so perfectly that, you know, even in our Constitution, right, there is the pursuit of liberty and happiness and health and, you know, Mm -hmm. health is a huge part of that, (laughs) um, that just the very basics of being able to survive and take, you know, have your health care um, accessible should and is, you know, one of the most essential human rights. And the fact that, you know, in this country, it's so backwards and that, you know, the only way to really kind of guarantee the fact that you have access to health care is either by being independently wealthy or tied mm-hmm. to a corporate job or, you know, having to jump through the hurdles of, you know, possibly public assistance is, you know, counterintuitive to basic human rights. But um, so it sounds like, you know, that you have this very personal story that connected you to the issue. Mm -hmm. Um, And then now do you work um, for an organization that you're helping, you know, on this specific campaign? Um, or is this just something that you're doing as an activist in your private time? Uh, well, both. I work with Organize Florida, mm-hmm. and Universal Healthcare is one of our... Okay, so tenants. tell me more about Organize Florida, because mm-hmm. I love the organization, but I feel like a lot of our listeners don't have any idea what Organize Florida is or <laughs> how they could be involved or, or, you know, what they do. So tell us a little bit about that. So Organize Florida is a membership-based organization. Mm-hmm. And what that means is is we organize neighborhoods and communities, especially um, lower-income, middle-income um, communities of color, where any kind of issues that we're dealing with, um, we actually build power by getting those communities educated, by getting them um, together uh, as as one collective to to push for something. As as you know, like you know, if we wanted to get Medicare for all, mm-hmm. you know, the two of us here talking. <laughs> I mean, if we go to Senator Nelson or whoever, right, or Senator Marco Rubio, they're not gonna. They're probably laugh at us, and literally. Right? Well, Marco so, Rubio won't even hear us. Exactly. Uh, so, so we, what we work on is getting, um, building power with nu- uh, with numbers of people, um, who experience the same type of issues, and getting them involved in, um, not only the political process, but mm-hmm. building a community so that we can um, affect change in the community. And we do a lot of policy work. We're mm-hmm. nonpartisan, um, so we are not affiliated with any party. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we get a lot of folks who've been, um, you know, just like with the Progressive Caucus, very similar. We get a lot of folks who've been, you know, just disenfranchised, disenfranchised. by either the two party system. I wouldn't even see a disenfranchised, it's disillusioned, disillusioned with politics. Like, you know, my mm-hmm. vote doesn't count and all that. Right. And we bring them into a community where they can actually see um, real change being affected and, um, you know, getting positive impacts in people's mm-hmm. lives. Beautiful. I love that. Um, okay, so tell me a little bit about what you did on Mother's Day because there was an article oh, yeah. that uh, several people sent me. Um, was it Action 10 or 10 Network that was mm-hmm. covering what you're doing? So tell me a little bit about Mother's Day. Yeah, so uh, 
we go out canvassing all the time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, honestly, it didn't really, I didn't really like, it didn't really click, you know, to me that, yeah, it was Mother's Day, mm-hmm. honestly. Um, I mean, I knew it was Mother's Day and I knew I was going to go out on Mother's Day. Right. Um, but, you know, it's just, you got to do what you got to do. And I knew that there was going to be a lot of people at this uh, farmer's market. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we were like, yeah, hey, we should go there. Right. <laughs> so me and two volunteers went down there to go, um, talk, just talk to people about, you know, universal health care and ask them, do you know what Medicare for all is? Right. And, and, you know, kind of get some of their personal stories and hopefully get some of their contact information so we can, you know, bring them into our community. And, um, the night before a, uh, reporter, uh, contacted us and said, mm-hmm. Hey, we'd like to come in and report on that. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that's, that's one of the ways that we do build power is, um, building that public narrative, which right. the, you know, the right wing kind of has it down pat, right? Sure. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Very, you know, very simple things that kind of get people vi- viscerally, right. which um, kind of frames their ideology um, and then gets it where, you know, they can like vote for this person or that person, even though really they don't share their values. Like sure. um, tax cuts, tax cuts, you know, right. like, um, so we need to make sure that we're getting that that narrative out there that healthcare is a human right because that everybody understands that and talk to people about it and make sure that they know that there's other folks out there and that there's a way to get this done. Mm. Um, and so, you know, we decided to go out that day and I'm really glad that they covered it. And I mean, I wouldn't change it. I was still able later that afternoon to spend time with my family. Aww. and Yeah. I have a 18 year old daughter. And do you, so. did you find you got more or less or the same amount of feedback on a holiday approaching people about more of a, it was just issue? a numbers. It's always a numbers game. So it was easier because it was more, people. you know, there's more people out there on a Sunday on mother's day trying to find, um, presents. Last for minute them. gifts. Yes. Yeah. I noticed that too. Or taking their mothers <laughs> out, you know? So then that kind of leads me to you're out there, you're educating people kind of on this concept and you brought with you and some of these were some some questions I was going to ask in general, because as you're kind of trying to educate people about this concept, I'm sure there are a lot of questions, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, So first of all, I know we kind of talked about it, but you said that people are even just confused about the difference between Medicare and Medicaid. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me? A little bit about that difference. Yeah, and that's very common because um, they sound very similar. Sure. (laughs) And uh, most people um, will not actually come in contact with one, right, until Mm -hmm. you have some kind of catastrophic illness or Mm -hmm. you lose your job or you become 65, right? So Medicare Mm -hmm. was set up in order to make sure that um, folks who have very specific needs Mm – that are gar- kind of guaranteed to happen mm-hmm. um, or have already happened have their health care paid for so they're not like thrown out in the street. Before Medicare was set up, right, mm-hmm. people with very high cost medical needs mm-hmm. were often just uh, left, left to die. out there. Yeah, left to die. Yeah, literally. And okay. so Medicare was set up. Um, there's uh, two groups of people mm-hmm. um, that – that it primarily helps. It's mm-hmm. people who are 65 and older. Right. And you pay in your, you can look on your, um, your, uh, no, you can look on your, uh, paycheck. Oh, okay. And you'll see a Medicare tax, uh-huh. right? It's right there. Yep. And you, so you pay into it your whole life. Right. And then once you're 65, you can get, uh, Medicare insurance. Mm-hmm. It's just an insurance that pays for your medical needs. And then also it helps people with disabilities. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cause those, costs are very high and so they include it for pe- folks that are older and for folks that are with disabilities. So it sounds like when it was being formed there was already the understanding that he- that healthcare is a human right. Mm-hmm. That they were that we, not even they, mm-hmm. us as a nation who enacted this were saying here are people who are, you know, guaranteed one way or another to face possible exorbitant medical costs mm-hmm. and that they have the right as human beings to have health care, regardless of the fact that they're older or they're disabled, they should have mm-hmm. health care like everyone else. And so they enacted this. And regardless of how much they technically paid into the system, whether you paid the maximum or the minimum amount, you you get it when you turn that age, right? It doesn't matter if you're Bill Gates. When Bill Gates turns 65, he qualifies for for Medicare. So it's not a it's not an entitlement. What year was this enacted? <sighs> oh man, now you're testing <laughs> me. It was 1940. Okay, so in the the 40s. It was in the 40s. Okay. But another thing about it, too, is that you got to remember the the first group of people that were actually paying for it 
were paying forward, right? right? Sure. Um, the first people who are receiving it didn't actually pay into it. Right. And so it's kind of a promise to the next generation. Right. So that's Medicare. Now tell me about Medicaid. So Medicaid is for folks who um, are lower income. Mm -hmm. That's basically what it is. So depending on what state you live in, you may or may not qualify. Every state has different uh, requirements, uh, uh, different guidelines. There's There are federal guidelines, but they're... Um, it doesn't actually include everybody. For example, in Florida, if you're a single adult and you're not disabled, mm -hmm. then and you don't have any dependents, you don't qualify for for Medicaid. Now, don't we have really poor Medicaid um, benefits here in Florida? A lot to do with Rick Scott and what he's kind of maneuvered the infrastructure for our <clears throat> state to look like. So, yeah, after. <laughs> The Affordable Care Act was passed. Mm -hmm. It allowed all states to expand Medicaid to as many folks as, as they felt that they, they could. Mm -hmm. And the federal government would pick up the rest of the tab, a certain proportion of it. Mm -hmm. And in the state of Florida, we were actually, not only were we one of the ones who decided not to, and Rick Scott actually pushed and our Florida state legislature, it wasn't just Rick Scott, it was mm -hmm. the Florida state legislature, mm. pushed to stop us from expanding Medicaid to folks who didn't have children, dependent children. Mm. Um, but they actually filed a lawsuit to stop um, the Affordable Care Act from doing that in any state. Why would Hambani. they do that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I can get into it all, you know, make so, it so would they so let me say what I think and you tell me <laughs> if this sounds familiar right. at all. <clears throat> to me, it sounds like they were so intent on being contrary to anything Obama tried to pass because they <clears throat> were playing partisan p politics, that they were more concerned with that than ensuring the people who lived in their state and making sure that the poor people had access to health care. Yeah, I don't think they even say that. They don't say that. Obviously, they don't say that publicly. They, <laughs> okay, go, let's go back to that ideology, right? Uh -huh. So <laughs> they have pushed this ideology of pull yourself up by your bootstraps, mm -hmm. right? Um, they push this ideology of racism. Mm -hmm. You remember the welfare queens, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they push this ideology of free markets. Capitalism and free markets are using religion, God's solution to everything. Mm -hmm. um, they actually think that there's this magical power and free markets that fix everything. <laughs> and so what we're what we're fighting against is a very simple yet powerful kind of way to look at the world, mm -hmm. which is entirely wrong. And so we need to make sure that folks understand that the reason that there is a market at all, the reason that there is an economy at all, at all mm -hmm. is to serve human beings. Right. And we need to make sure that folks who need healthcare, who need food, who need housing, right. that they are supplied that because they have this ideology where if you have to get on food stamps, if you have to get Medicaid, for mm -hmm. example, um, if you have to get any kind of government help at all, government is totally the wrong way. It's evil, mm -hmm. right? It's all corrupt. And they're going to keep on pushing that. So what we have to understand is that Government is not an end all and be all. Mm -hmm. It's there to work for us. And mm -hmm. no matter where you are in your life, everybody's going to have some kind of situation come up. Um, nobody does anything. There's no such thing as a self made millionaire. Mm -hmm. um, you have to use the roads that we paid for with taxes, mm -hmm. right? Um, the internet that we developed with tax money. We have to make sure that folks in the 75, 80, 100 years that you have to live on this planet, that you have the best possible chances. And I mean, a lot of it has to do with racism, patriarchy, um, the free market uh, myths that they put out there. But this is what confuses <clears throat> me and where I have the disconnect is if we have no infrastructure into all of the classes, if mm -hmm. we have this huge disparity. I mean, it's 
we're going to collapse, you know, that to me, even regardless of what party you are, who you're, you know, what your your beliefs are, if you don't understand how we're all interconnected, and that helping every member of our society helps us collectively, and the fact that they've been able to disconnect that concept, even with, you know, the ideology that they're pushing, that the fact that, you know, the better... L- uh, the healthier we all are, the better quality mm-hmm. that all of our citizens have and everyone in our community makes us better collectively. The fact that they're so disconnected from that and that they think that they can just essentially, you know, abuse and, you know, sentence to die or, you know, not provide the basic necessities for any part of our society, how they think that that it doesn't hurt us all equally is what I don't understand. Yeah, and you got to look at it from the, their their ideology. Mm-hmm. If somebody is rich mm-hmm. and has what they need, they think they worked hard and deserved it. Sure, and no one's taking that away, <clears throat> but that doesn't mean that it doesn't necessarily mean that they're <laughs> that they're any deserving than anybody else, or that they worked harder. Sure, absolutely than not anybody else. Like for example. Um, Let's look at universities, mm-hmm. right? So let's say you're a kid deciding on which university to go to mm-hmm. and you get accepted to uh, Columbia and you get accepted to USF. Mm-hmm. Both are top rate schools, mm-hmm. right? And you're, and you're doing this for business, okay? Okay. So <laughs> if you're going into business, you need to, you need to have friends who have capital, mm-hmm. So, which one was likely to get you friendships with? It's all. It's about networking. You're gonna say Cornell, right? That's what we're leading towards. Cornell or Columbia, whatever. <laughs> Columbia, um, sorry, whichever yes. one. It doesn't matter. Yes. It doesn't matter. So, a lot of the the reason that um, people have access to wealth is because they already have access Absolutely. to wealth. Yes. And so, it's just a way to make it so that um, they can look down at other people, whether you know you're a single mom or you're black or you're a a Hispanic immigrant or something like that. And they can say, well, you know what? Look at this person. They did it um, without regard to whether or not those things were accessible to other people. And so uh, one of the the biggest, you know, elephants in the room of uh, politics right now in Florida is Mm -hmm. the opioid epidemic. Sure, There wasn't a lot of people worried about it when it was, you know, Wiping out, devastating. Oh no, 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 no! There oh, wasn't sorry. a lot of people worried about <laughs> drug ad- ac- epidemics. Oh, when, when it was when they think it was like the black of, community yes. or something like that, right? Mm-hmm. But now that it's affecting white kids, right? It, not, I mean, obviously, it needs to be solved. We don't sure. want any kids, black or white, to be, you know, getting killed in the streets because you know they overdose. But now that this is happening to white communities, for example, Bill Arrakis, right? The the guy who was the representative in my district mm-hmm. when my father had passed away and has since um, fought really hard against um, expanding health care to anybody mm-hmm. is uh, now he wants to, he voted for uh, this past legislative session in the state um, for, I don't know, some pitiful amount, but it was like $50 million for health care, mm. uh, mental health care to help people, um, for opioid addictions and such, which is <laughs> a drop in the bucket. But so th- you you can't separate, you cannot separate that ideology from what they're doing, that the free markets are the end all and be all. It's some kind of magical godlike fix, um, racism, sexism. Um, and then of course the uh, individualism, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Those things are what are keeping folks voting against their self-interest. And those are the kind of things that we got to talk about because this bill, Medicare for All, mm-hmm. well, not even necessarily this particular bill, but sure. um, the idea of universal health care mm-hmm. resonates whether you're Republican or Democrat. So um, that's those are the kind of things that we have to push through. And I don't think it's going to help, really. The people who are getting voting into office, such as the Rick Scotts and the Bill mm-hmm. Rackuses, they're not changeable, right? We have to talk to our neighbors. We have to talk to folks to make sure that we get the right people elected. I love that. Absolutely. I love how we always land it back to that. <laughs> um, so we've gotten a bit off topic, which I don't mind doing at all because I think all of this is important because there are so many <laughs> factors that come into every single issue, you know, and as the 
the Progressive Caucus, we try to educate our members on every single issue that's on our platform. And what we learn is every single issue is so much more complicated than we originally mm-hmm. know. So I try to give people, you know, kind of these thoughts so that they can digest, you know, the larger issues. But let's get back to this bill. There's actually been a specific bill. So we've been talking about the differences between Medicare and Medicaid. Generally speaking, there seems to be, and like you said, with Bernie Sanders, more of an idea and thought path towards some kind of universal health care, mm-hmm. single payer health care, or Medicare for all. You hear those terms thrown around a lot, especially when you're working in the progressive community, that that's at the forefront of issues because we go back to health care as a human right. Mm-hmm. We're looking at fundamental rights. So there has been a bill that has been introduced in the House of Representatives, and there's a corresponding bill in the Senate mm-hmm. nationally. Um, and this is a essentially a Medicare for all bill. So can you explain to me, in general, the concept of Medicare for all, as opposed to just for the disabled or people over 65? Yeah, the short answer is you take the age that you qualify for Medicaid, mm-hmm. and you lower it to age zero. You mean uh, Medicare? The yeah, age that's you qualify Medicare. for Medicare? Yeah, okay. Sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> that's okay. So you just take the age and you lower it to zero. Okay. And you have anybody who is a resident gets the health care that they need. Mm-hmm. You just get the card. You you know, you have to go to the doctor. Your exams, your prescriptions, all of that are, are covered. So, um, but the longer answer is, is... You have a system right now where we have private insurance companies mm-hmm. such as Blue Cross or Cigna mm-hmm. or, gosh, I don't know, there's so many of them. And you have the insurance companies take premiums from you yep. through uh, generally an employer pays like 80% mm-hmm. if you're very lucky <laughs> or more if you're even luckier. Right. And uh, you pay maybe $50, $100 a month and you can go to the doctor you have to pay your copay. Right. Um, and then the insurance covers, they, they negotiate in the background and they cover the doctor bill, right? Mm-hmm. So what a universal system that is called single payer means is you don't have Blue Cross Florida paying mm-hmm. the doctor and then Cigna paying the doctor right. and then Amerigroup paying the doctor. Right. You have one single entity paying the doctor. Gotcha. <clears throat> for everybody who goes to the doctor, right? Mm-hmm. So that's why that's where that term single payer comes from. Mm. It's because it's uh, just one entity paying the doctor. Gotcha. So, I mean, even just very basically right up front, you're mm-hmm. going to get a lot of bureaucracy just shaved right off. Right, because absolutely. You that's don't what have... I've been seeing and reading <clears throat> up on some of this. Absolutely, yeah. I'm sure a lot of you guys know people or at least one person removed of somebody who's works in medical billing, mm-hmm. right? You know, this person was denied for this and this person was denied for that or this, you know, sure. it's a very complicated process. Yeah, it's it actually really a profession. Is. And so mm-hmm. you get rid of a lot of that. And so what um, Medicare for all would do as a quote unquote single pair system mm-hmm. is instead of our employers and us paying the insurance companies who then in turn pay any kind of doctor bills that you have, you have a single entity that we pay, which is Medicare, which is already set up right. <laughs> conveniently. And then <laughs> um, Medicare would pay your your doctor bill. Okay. Um, so is how is, is how is that different? So it all is the same thing. Universal <clears throat> health care, it means that everybody's covered. Yeah, it's not the same thing. So okay. uh, Obamacare... Um, that many people know it as, but it's actually technically the Affordable Care Act mm-hmm. that was passed in 2010. Right. Its goal was to be universal health care through a public, which was called the single, um, I mean, it was called the public option, mm-hmm. right? Which is basically like a, a little tiny mini Medicare that you could buy into. Right. Plus private insurers. Okay. So, and it, its goal was to be universal health care. So universal health care is exactly what it sounds like. Mm-hmm. It's everybody who is a resident gets health care, okay. right, that they need. Single payer is a special type of universal health care where you have one single entity paying everybody's bill. So you don't have any more Florida Blue. You don't right. have any more Cigna. You don't have gotcha. any more Amerigroup. Okay. Um, I mean, they may be there for uh, like different kind of insurances that are uh, there for like uh, elective surgeries mm-hmm. or non-essential surgeries, mm-hmm. but uh, they won't exist as uh, 
the regular insurance that you we have now. So with the of uh, of the Affordable Care Act, did we <coughs> technically have universal health care? No, we still have twenty four million people who aren't insured. Okay. Um. So. What I, I did pull up some statistics since we started talking about statistics. Um, and currently, from what I read, we have 153 million Americans in general, or and 47% of the country. I'm sorry, 153 million? We have like over 300 million people hmm. in the United States? Maybe this is just participating in healthcare. I'll read you this blurb okay. that I that okay. I cut out. Um, and I'd love for you to fact check the article. <laughs> um, but it says, currently we have 153 Americans. Oh, I'm sorry. Or 47%. So it's 45. That number equates to 47% mm-hmm. of the country. So we have 40% of the country who receive their insurance um, from their employers. So a little okay. under half. Mm-hmm. Um, and then another 38 get their um, insurance from government programs, mm-hmm. Medicaid, Medicare. Mm-hmm. And then there are the last two buckets, which said around 5% of the population um, get it from the Affordable Health Care Act or health care private marketplace. private insurance off the marketplace. Okay. And that approximately 9% have no insurance at all. And that, Even, what's the date on that? This was in May okay. that I pulled this article. Okay. Um, so that gives you a little breakdown that 50% of people get it from work. You know, mm-hmm. that's how many people are tied to their jobs who can't change or feel, you know, that they, mm-hmm. they have to work to just get their health care. Um, a little over under half then still get it from the government. And then there's, you know, 10% who don't have it at all um, is what it sounds like. So that leads me to kind of talk about the frustrations of, the acts, the healthcare that we do have, that not only is it through the private insurance companies and all the frustrations that come with that, and any of us who have ever tried to process a claim, I mean, I've spent so many hours of my life with insurance companies trying to get something paid for that I've like literally lost my mind. Um, but, you know, another reason why it's frustrating to have to get it through your job is because it does make you feel that you might have to work in something that you wouldn't normally work in just to get health care for you and your mm-hmm. family. And I actually saw a candidate today who was running um, s- pull out of the race and say that they had just secured a job that offered amazing benefits in health care and that their husband had had some medical issues and that they essentially couldn't give up this job um, in order to so to do what they needed to do to finish the campaign and run for this position at this and point in their life. And why is it that Congress is full of the richest people <laughs> in the country? It's because there's only people who can afford to run in many cases, right? Absolutely. So it just shows that not only are we talking about just healthcare, we're talking about so many other choices mm-hmm. in your life that now revolve around just your access to healthcare. Mm-hmm. So having a Medicare for all, you know, just in that sense would right off the bat, give almost everybody more freedom to not have to necessarily associate every choice they're making about what they want to do for a living. Mm-hmm. Also with the quality of their health care. Um, what are some more benefits, do you think, that are just undeniable from the concept of Medicare for All? So one of the things that personally affects me is mental health care. Mm. I have an 18-year-old daughter mm-hmm. who has um, some issues uh, that have to do with mental health care. Mm-hmm. And uh, she's a very loving, sensitive, very perceptive young woman. <laughs> And when she realized she was turning 18, she realized that she wasn't going to be on kid care anymore. So mm. it's it's partially funded like by the Medicaid program uh, for children, children's health insurance program. But it's it's not Medicaid because, you know, I do have a job. And what it does is it, insurance, it ensures that children have access to health care. Our son's on it. With my employer, in order to add a dependent, it costs... I think it was $380 a month. It it was something very expensive Mm -hmm. (laughs) that I really wasn't able to afford. So this is really helpful. And one of the first things that she was upset about was me having to pay for her health insurance Mm. now. I, you know, I wish I could hide it from her. (laughs) You know, I wish I could hide it from her. And then honestly, I don't know how she knows that it would cost me $400 a month to put her on the insurance. Mm -hmm. And she, like, you know, she's, she went to, you know, very 
very uh, intensive classes, and mm-hmm. she's brighter than way brighter than I would ever be. <laughs> and but so one of the things that would really help is um, for parents like myself. Mm-hmm. Like I am very, I know I am very fortunate, and I'm going to make sure my daughter has that insurance. Right. But think of this: in Florida, we didn't expand Medicaid. My daughter doesn't have a dependent. Thank goodness, and hopefully not for a very long time. Um, I would love to be a grandmother, but I'm not old enough to be a grandmother right. yet. <laughs> so, yeah, you have folks who are going to be turning 18 years old, and uh, technically you can keep them on your plan right. you know, as a child until the 26, thanks to Affordable Care Act. Mm-hmm. But how many how many families, you know, in the area that I live? I live over, um, you know, near Forest Hills, uh, we're a working class neighborhood, mm-hmm. you know, we have, um, we can't afford to pay $400 a month for that. So, I mean, I'm going to make it work, but, you know, it's just not everybody's going to be able to, and you don't want to have kids just starting out worried about that. There's so many kids, they, kids know, you know. Or kids <clears throat> who are still in high school when they're 18 mm-hmm. that have mental health <clears throat> care issues yeah. and don't have access and then feel like their only option is to pick up a rifle mm-hmm. and go, you know, uh, murder people in their classroom. A, I have a little bit of thoughts on that. I think it's more than <laughs> mental health issues. I think it has a lot to do with the... Uh, oh, sure. Yeah. With patriarchy. patriarchy. Yes. <laughs> and, and the male attitude. There's Thanks, absolutely... You me a Coke. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, I mean, I'm just saying that, let's say, more conservative people or, you know, gun rights advocates are all saying it's, you know, it's not the guns. We need to expand health care. And- actually, most people don't do that. It's going to be they're going to hurt themselves. Right. That's, that's what, or or their girlfriends, you know, domestic abuse and things like that. So. But if you're naive and you think that, you know, health care is the option as opposed to gun reform, not saying that's naive, okay, I am. But <laughs> um, then you should be for universal health care. You should be for expanding health care. You can't, you can't be on both sides of the fence. Yeah, and that statistic that you mentioned earlier, it's 9% of the population doesn't have health insurance. Mm-hmm. I mean... We're the richest countries in the world. We can't, we can't, co- we cover 90%. We can't cover, you know, another 10%. That's ridiculous. So um, let's talk about this specific, specific bill because there has been one that's been introduced. And mm-hmm. it looked like, actually, it's a very old bill mm-hmm. that was introduced a long time ago. And then it was picked back up kind of around 2017 by one um, representative. And then most recently, Keith Ellison Mm -hmm. um, has really kind of done the big push to kind of get this uh, bill signed on by quite a few Democrats. Um, Almost all of them, yeah. So this bill, let's let's name the bill. All right, so before we name the bill, though, let's um, uh, just make sure folks know what we're talking about. Yes. So this would be a federal bill that would cover every single state. Okay. Right. So this is not um, something that has to do specifically with Florida. Right. I know there's. I know we just did a That's recap true. of the yeah, Florida legislative good. session. Uh-huh. So to go forward. Yeah. So on the national level, <clears throat> um, there's been a bill introduced in the House of Representatives. Um, so tell me, do you know the bill name? What was the bill name? It's called um, Expanded and Improved Medicare for All. Okay. It's like HR six seven six. And it was in 2003, it was introduced by uh, Representative John Conyers in the House mm-hmm. of Representatives, yeah. the one branch of Congress. And uh, in Congress, uh, Conyers is not going back into Congress. And so Keith Ellison um, picked it up. And it's, is it is is it when Ellison <clears throat> picked it up that it got so many people to sign on to it? Sponsors or did it already have as yeah. many sponsors? No, we had about 50... Ninety. It was ninety or fifty. I might be. Um, okay. And now it has a hundred. Now we have a hundred and some. Yeah, one hundred and twenty-two. It says, mm-hmm. and seven of them are from Florida. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's talk about this bill. I know you didn't want to get too far into it, and we're not going to go too far into it because I know that just bores people to death to hear, talk about actual bills. We want to go far into it in respect to what we want out of it and what it does and what it doesn't do. So essentially, um, from what I gleamed on it, it um, it's it's very good as far as it talks about definitely being Medicare for all. From what I understood, it wouldn't have any co-pays or deductibles mm-hmm, right. associated with it. Mm-hmm. Um, that it would start from birth and go all the way mm-hmm. up. Um, that 
it would penalize or it would prohibit other private insurance companies from offering the same plan or the same benefits that the government would offer? Is that the understanding that you have from the bill? Or how how, do, how would it affect insurance companies? So um, the, the insurance companies as they stand now, like the Florida Blues, the mm-hmm. Cigna's, the right. Amer groups, they would have to, um, if they wanted to offer a health insurance plan Mm -hmm. that offered the same amount of benefits, they would have to match the cost of that or um, I forget exactly what it is, but it's some kind of additional tax or something. So would it put insurance companies out of business? Yes. Well, not completely because you could still have, you could still buy an insurance plan Mm -hmm. for any kind of elected surgeries. Okay. But I did also read that it had some ideas for anybody displaced out of those insurance mm-hmm. companies, like yeah. offering benefits and mm-hmm. reemployment opportunities for anybody who works for insurance companies to, you know, not lose out because we'd be switching and because it'd be putting insurance companies out of business. What would be a benefit from having not having insurance companies, do you think? So the uh, there's many. <laughs> um, <laughs> it is really, really important to have this bill be a part of appropriations, which means that it's actually part of our budget. Okay. If could be, Because if we don't have, if it's not a part of appropriations uh-huh. and we don't have funding right. to make sure that we're helping folks get like real job training, yeah. um, real job placement, that's mm-hmm. not a small, a small, it's not a small task. No. It can cost $3,000 a person per month for job training and, and all that. Right. Um, so that's extremely important because I see if we don't have insurance companies, a lot of folks that's gonna, that are going to need jobs. But right. we have a lot of jobs that we need to be filled. So. Sure. But there, there's several important factors in not having insurance companies. Number one. Yes. An insurance company is a word we all know. It's called a corporation. <laughs> there is a an entity that is created and it's incorporated or called a corporation um, as, as a legal status right. um, for two reasons. Mm-hmm. There's two. There's only two reasons for this thing existing as right. a corporation. One is to remove individual responsibility for people who invest in it, right? Mm-hmm. So like, if you go into the stock market and you invest in a corporation and right. then the corporation turns out to be a serial killer, right? Uh-huh. You as an investor are not legally re- responsible. Okay. Okay. So that's number one. It's like a legal protection for people who invest. But number two mm-hmm. is the sole purpose of this entity existing yeah. is for profits for right. shareholders. Yes. It doesn't matter what it does. Right. If the corporation is not getting profits every quarter. It is not living up to its legal purpose. And that's why we have corporations doing horrible things like insurance companies denying claims mm-hmm. for people, even um, though they're supposed to be covered, right. that they deny people with pre existing conditions, mm-hmm. um, which, of course, the Affordable Care Act helped get rid of. Right. Thank um, and then, yeah, and you have, you know, places even everybody knows about, like, you know, the tire companies mm-hmm. where they've done um, analyses where they weigh the cost of fixing a problem they know about over paying the lawsuits that happen when people die. Mm-hmm. And they will actually pay the lawsuits because it's uh, it's cheaper than fixing the problem. And th- that's why corporations like that, like insurance companies, are such a problem is like we said before, we only have as an individual, right, 70 if we're lucky, 80 if we're luckier, and 100 if we're really lucky, years to live on this planet. And we, here we have an entity that we created for our benefit, which is actually working against us. Um, another thing is that they're made for profit, of mm-hmm. course, for the shareholders, but they're often ma- also made for profit for the CEOs. Mm. So profits aren't always bad, and I don't want anybody to to think that it's it, it can be a good thing for somebody to be motivated, you know, to work a little bit harder or to invest in a new company that can be doing good because they might, you know, get a little bit of a nest egg or something. But these CEOs are making just outlandish salaries, and their salaries go up when they pay less claims, and so that that is just a disaster when it comes to. A company that is a corporation that is supposed to be providing health care for people because their mission as a corporation goes against what the company is supposed to do, which is pay for people's health care. It just doesn't sink. And so by getting rid of corporations, 
which pay for health care in some cases if you're lucky and you don't get declined for your surgery or whatever you need. We have Medicare, which is actually has a great track work track record on taking care of what people need. So do insurance companies set the prices <clears throat> of health care or influence the price of health care at all? A little bit. So I don't know of all the specifics. Somebody who is working in insurance would know much more than I do. Right. But um, like, for example, um, Florida Blue, they will go to, if they, it's a, um, a PPO, which is a, a certain type of insurance mm-hmm. plan, right? Um, you can go to this many doctors for this, and then you pay this price. Perfect. And they negotiate that in right. the background, like how much they're going to yeah. pay the doctors and stuff. Yeah. So um, they can control it a little. Um, there's been some cases where insurance companies have been um, colluding on uh, – prescription drug prices yeah. and stuff like that in the past. And so they can have a little bit of, of of control on it, but the biggest control on it is whether or not they're actually providing the health care. Mm. So um, an insurance company will, um, you know, let's say if you have to go to get your radiology stuff at this place right. or this place, yeah. right? Um, they can control like their network of places that you can go. Absolutely. Um, but it's not public. So you can't know how much this radiologist is going to be charging compared to this radiologist. Right. And whether, if it's like a network, there, it's just, it's a lot of confusing stuff. And if, if somebody's had to deal with, you know, specialists and things like that, you know that <sighs> that, can, that can just drive you crazy at night you went to the wrong doctor and so the insurance company is not paying right. this amount and so there's a lot of things that are um, affecting people in their everyday lives that can be helped a lot by medicare because medicare can actually negotiate nationwide we can get an exact precise number on how much each procedure costs and it'll just it'll just be a lot more streamlined well, also it'll help businesses who no longer have to <clears throat> burden the, you know, t- pay the burden or worry about health care for their employees, which seems to be, mm-hmm. you know, something that has a lot to do. Like my, you know, my friends who own small businesses, one of the biggest concerns or expenses is, you know, offering health care for their employees. Mm-hmm. This takes that out of the equation. So the businesses mm-hmm. are free to focus on other benefits for their employees that don't involve health care um so i'm reading kind of the questionnaire that you brought in i'm i'm glancing at all the different information i tried to kind of glean before you got here and we're talking about kind of setting the the prices there is a question how will we keep drug prices under control what would be kind of your answer or how are how how would the drug prices be affected by this so that's a really good question um you know, in a in a free market type of system, which is mostly what the United States have mm-hmm. has, the uh, drug developers yes will want to sell their product at the highest price possible, mm-hmm. and then the insurance company will want to, in general, pay the least you know price possible, right. and so they're kind of negotiated. So, what having a Medicare for all system will do is give us better bargaining power. Mm-hmm. So we have uh, more than three hundred million people. That will be um, collectively bargaining for, which is actually a, a great thing to do, and <laughs> so we can actually. That sounds like union talk. <laughs> I know, right? Um, that, that's exactly what it is. It's a it's a huge, powerful union, and so we'll be able to say, "Hey, you know, we're not going to pay you know, five hundred dollars each pill. We're going to pay you know three hundred dollars each pill, mm-hmm. whatever it is." And so you Because there's no one else to pay them anything else. <clears throat> yeah. So one of the the problems that we've had seen in, in healthcare is prescription prices. Mm-hmm. Um of course everybody knows about the the guy who Nick, Yeah, what was his name? I can't remember his name. The one who but, went crying to jail over his Wu Tang album. <laughs> yes. And so I want I don't know who got that Wu Tang album. <laughs> um Tim Heverlane might know. He was looking he was looking to buy it. So <laughs> that doesn't surprise me. Um so we have um one one negotiation, which is a huge powerhouse, and if they want to sell in the United States, they're going to have to to get that that contract signed. So, if there's a listener out there who <laughs> might have health care through their employer and and doesn't feel necessarily connected to this issue, mm-hmm. but 
is paying an exorbitant amount of money for prescription either for mm-hmm. their child. Like I know I have so many friends that have eight, like the ADHD medicine, which isn't covered, mm-hmm. which costs, you know, two to $400 a month, or, you know, they have, you know, an issue where their medicine is exorbitant. Even if they have health care, this could help. I mean, uh, yeah, this could help negotiate prices for mm-hmm. the pharmaceuticals and make health care more affordable for them in the long run as well. Yeah, because what you're doing is you're already paying for and um, drug prices which aren't being negotiated properly. So let's say if you are paying, let's say if your health insurance is $500 a month in your group plan, right? Mm-hmm. And let's say your um, employer is paying it all. Um, that's great. That's wonderful. Right. Um, however, the employer, um, when they're giving you your benefits and all that, that's part of your benefits package, right? right? So they're including that in, in what they're offering you. Mm-hmm. So a large part of that $500 that they're paying per month for your health insurance is actually going to pay hospitals, Mm -hmm. which um, in the back end, Medicaid doesn't have the same capability of, (laughs) believe it or not, of negotiating drug prices. It's actually a huge problem. Mm -hmm. One of the things that um, the GOP has, and actually, honestly, some Democrats, but not all of them, have been fighting (laughs) against is um, uh, Medicaid being able to negotiate pr- drug prices. So if somebody goes to the hospital because they don't have health insurance, mm-hmm. and they're going to get the medicine they need, they're going to get the you know everything that goes in their IVs and mm-hmm. all that, and that's going to be at an up charge. Right. And where they're going to up it even more is because they charge the insurance companies even more to cover the difference. Right. Mm-hmm. So you're having all that um, benefits package that you could be getting in your pocket. You're giving it to drug companies. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, if we have Medicare for all, then the hospitals won't have to worry about who's coming in the door, about whether or not they're going to get paid. Right. And it'll actually be a more streamlined process for everybody. I mean, and honestly, it's, I mean, who doesn't want somebody to be able to have the ability to go to the doctor? It's just, it just boggles <laughs> my mind. So all the all, all of us normal people, whether you're Democrat or Republican, do. Um, I mean, it's it's honestly um, just people who have just lost touch, um, which more often than not are elected to office, unfortunately. Oh, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. So what would be some of the negative pushback do you hear from for Medicare for all? What are what do you find that people either have the most misunderstanding about or the biggest yeah. fears? Yeah, so what the biggest one is I don't want to have to wait to go to the doctor. Right. So uh, with a Medicare for all system, you wouldn't because the doctors would still actually be there. It's going to be the same doctors. Um, And ideally in a bill that eventually passes, we'd have funding to get even more doctors. Because we actually, we do in in, in many areas, especially rural areas, Mm -hmm. we have a shortage of doctors. Mm -hmm. Um, In some places, we have a a shortage of doctors who are uh, culturally aware of the communities that they serve. Mm -hmm. Um, So Why would that be important? So you need to be able to trust your doctor. You need to be able to communicate with your doctor. Mm -hmm. Um, If you have your, for example, if um, you don't speak English and you have your kid, Mm -hmm. I mean, how much does a 12-year-old, they're probably uh, much more mature in their years (laughs) than most 12-year-olds because they have to do this their whole life. But how much does a 12-year-old really understand? Mm -hmm. Make sure that their parents take the the pills the right way, all that. Um, So... And, and, and there's different communities that have different needs. Some sure. communities may have a different way of discussing a particular issue that's mm, very sensitive. Right. And so if the doctor doesn't discuss it in a certain way. Right. So you you need to have um, – we need to have more doctors. We need to have more trained doctors. But, um, you know, th- there's also – there's already rationing. You have to get your – procedures approved through your insurance companies mm-hmm. already. Yeah. Um, if you have particular types of... And they could be of, denied. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you go over to um, a different country, you can have, you know, a vacation and something happens to you. Uh, I mean, there's it's already happening, but the thing about Medicare is it's already accepted everywhere. Mm. Um, it doesn't change the doctor. Mm. Um, the doctor's just getting paid by anybody else. So this is not a national health insurance plan like they do in... In Great Britain, mm-hmm. the doctors are not employed by the state. Mm. They're still employed by whatever hospital or if they're a family doctor, you know, they're a small business person. They just get a paid, you know, they get paid the uh, Medicare rather than your insurance company. So it's just changing who pays for mm-hmm. it. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so let's go back to this bill. This bill, um, from what I was saying, um, has 200 or 190 something. Um, 122, I think. Co-sponsors? Yeah. And I did the math. And in order to have this bill pass, we'd need 218 votes. I think it has more than that on the co-sponsors. But anyway, okay. we'd need... 25 Republicans to vote for this. Um, oh, no, you're right. We have 122 Democratic sponsors, but we have close to 200 Democratic uh, members in the House altogether. Mm-hmm. So if we got all of the Democrats in the entire House of Republicans to vote for this, we would still need 25 Republicans unless we flipped 25 legislative mm-hmm. seats um, to have this pass, which sounds like a lot, but in the grand scheme of things, isn't completely you know, um, unobtainable. So for people in general who are listening to this and feel, you know, motivated to want to try to help this bill, what do you advise people um, to do in order to help try to get this passed? Um, Well, the first thing that you can do is um, just, you know, if you have any questions, Mm -hmm. um, you can contact me personally Mm -hmm. Um, you can definitely Google. That's our best friend. <laughs> and uh, you can contact Keith Ellison's office. So you just, you know, do Google Representative Keith Ellison. Mm-hmm. The interns there are very knowledgeable on this oh, specific nice bill. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. is. Wow. Um, so if you have any questions, just reach out to me or do a search and you can, you know. So if you're going to say out. that, you're going to have to provide some kind of contact information. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, my name. Debbie, which is D-E-B-B-I-E mm-hmm. at organizeflorida.org. Pretty Organize easy. Florida is all spelled out. Okay. And um, so you're more than welcome to email me or you can find me on Facebook. <laughs> um, but the, the – so that's the most important thing is to just – if you have any questions about it, you can say, how are we going to pay for Medicare for All? Just put it in your Google. And here I am on radio and I'm actually like <laughs> typing my hands out. Like, <laughs> but, yeah, you just, you know, you Google it. Um, how are we going to pay for it? Um, the second thing is, is to talk to your neighbors about it. And that's what we do a lot. Right. Um, there's organized Florida. We go, I go out um, at least three times a week, a lot of times a weekend, sometimes in the evening. And I go to either neighborhoods mm-hmm. and I go door to door or I go to events with my clipboard and I just mm-hmm. talk to people. I do get contact info so I can keep people um, organized because right. that's you know part of what we do. <laughs> yeah. Make sure if we have an event or if we're going to go do a visit at a legislator's office, like we can contact people. Um, and uh, also I know that the um, DSA, mm-hmm. Democratic Socialists of America in Tampa, mm-hmm. have been doing a lot of – uh, canvassing around Seminole Heights area, and that that going and knocking on doors, a lot of people don't realize how powerful that really is. So something as simple as and I can help you train. I can train people to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, practice, um, get you the you know the information on your clipboard, and you just go knock on your da- neighbor's door and say, "Hey, you know, I'm Debbie and." Um, out here talking to folks about healthcare. Uh, so, do you have time for a few questions? You just have a conversation. So what I'm hearing you say is one education. That's mm-hmm. the key to the very fundamental education Educa- and organizing, like making sure that you keep in contact with those folks, Ag- educating yourself and then mm-hmm. educating people yep. in your sphere of influence, whether it's your neighbors or your family or people mm-hmm. that you're talking to, making sure you educate everyone else. And then what about, making sure and holding accountable and asking people who are running for office who are going to either support this or not support this if this is on their platform Mm -hmm. and making sure that you're voting for people who have signed on or who support either this bill or some kind of Medicare for all. How Mm -hmm. important is that? That's actually one of the most important things too um, is making sure that we're getting people elected and you have to ask them to know (laughs) are they going to vote for them or not. So Um, right now, since we're going to be having elections in a few months Mm -hmm. is prime time for getting contact with people, uh, who are running for office. Mm. So whether you live in Pasco, Hillsborough, Pinellas, Mm -hmm. Polk, uh, South Hillsborough, 
what you want to do is just find out where you just, all you have to do is just go into uh, Facebook mm -hmm. and you go into um, candidate. Uh, actually, yeah, just type in uh, candidate meet and greet. Just mm -hmm. go to your Facebook and the search bar, candidate meet and greet or mm -hmm. candidate canvas, mm -hmm. C-A-N-V-A-S-S. -S, mm -hmm. And you're going to find every single candidate, right? <laughs> yeah, right. And they're going to post every single event that they that they have. Mm -hmm. So you just find out where they're going to be and you go up to them and you say, uh, have you heard of HR 676? Mm -hmm. Will you commit to co-sponsor it if you're elected? Well, first you have to figure out who your representative is. <laughs> and you can Google mm -hmm. that. Who's my representative? Mm -hmm. um, and you can type in your address and it will tell you what district you're mm -hmm. located in. And then you can, you know, Google search for who's running in that district. But mm -hmm. do you know, um, like, which candidates have signed on to that so far? Mm -hmm. Like, which candidates do you know so far have actually s said that they're committed in co-sponsoring or being a part of this bill? So locally, we have uh, Representative Kathy Castor. Mm -hmm. And she's running unopposed anyway, so she doesn't yeah, have to win her primary. She has a very safe seat. She's a champion of ours. Okay. Um, we asked her to co-sponsor it, and a week later she did. <laughs> it, nice. was, it was And nothing. she held like a... Like a like an event for it, I remember. And mm -hmm. so, okay, so Kathy Castor is completely on board yeah, with this. She's a federal representative mm -hmm. um, for Congress in Tampa. Mm -hmm. And then, so she's the only one locally that has actually co-sponsored it. Well, unless you count Dar Darren Soto in okay. Orlando. Mm -hmm. um, Representative Darren Soto in Orlando has also uh, co-sponsored it. Now, you said he's being primaried. Uh, do you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> do you know if his primary challenger has has agreed to support um, this? I'm not familiar if Alan Grayson has um, agreed to. I would be surprised if he wasn't. Okay. So, um, so Alan Grayson or Ben America, if you're listening, call up and tell Debbie that you, you're <laughs> co-sponsoring this bill for sure, so we know where you stand. Um, uh, and you said Bill Bill Arrakis, the gentleman running against Bill Arrakis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, like, let's say if you're standing in the middle of Tampa, mm -hmm. right? Um, you have uh, five districts right near you. There's five total. Mm -hmm. So, right in the middle is uh, Kathy Castor, and she's sponsored it. Um, the only other Democrat in the area. I'm hesitant to call him that, but that's what's on his voter <laughs> registration. <laughs> um, so a registered Democrat who's elected to, you know, Congress in the area is uh -huh. um, Charlie Crist. <laughs> and uh, he will, I'm, he, he hasn't. And I've, <laughs> I've contacted him, even though I'm not in his district and kind of got a little bit of run around from some of his staff. And um, we had folks uh, from the um, progressive Democrats of America, Go, uh, especially every. I'm sure a lot of people here in the Progressive Democrats know um, the caucus know Mike Fox. Mm -hmm. He's a workhorse, amazing man, and he's been pushing really hard on this bill and other bills. So if you live in Pinellas County mm -hmm. and um, you Google who is my representative in Congress and Charlie Chris comes up, please call him tomorrow and tell him we need. Uh, universal health care, best way to do it is Medicare for all, co-sponsor HR 676. It would be greatly helpful. And uh, then, of course, we have um, – so those are the two Democrats in the area. And like I said, there are five. So the other three are north of us are is uh, Bill Arrakis, who will never sponsor it. Dennis Ross is actually retiring. Don't worry about him. But we have to worry about, about the candidates. running yep, mm -hmm. candidates. And I think there's four Democrats in that race so far. Andrew Learned, there's a Pena, there's a, um, there's a, there's two other candidates okay. too. Yeah. So there's, yeah, there's a lot of candidates and, um, we need to get some folks out there to ask, um, whether or not they will co-sponsor mm -hmm. HR 676. Yeah. And then also south of us is Buchanan. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a, it's a Republican, very Republican district. Like, so they have this little scale that they use. Uh -huh. We've to, talked about it before. <laughs> okay, on show. so um, the Cook scale, uh -huh. and his is a plus seven, mm. which is a Republican plus, plus seven. So generally, anything over a four or five is not very winnable. Um, there is a, a person running um, who I believe is actually for Medicare for all. 
I forget his name. Um, okay. Of course, Russ Jambroni just moved to that district mm. um, from uh, East Hillsboro, and uh, Chris Radulich. It's like two like fairly well known activists in mm-hmm. the community are in that district. So, best of luck to them. <laughs> I think uh, Nina Tatlock, who's oh, Nina, in PDA, no, Nina, the, Nina, no? Nina, okay, because I, I don't believe she, Russ said they were in the same district, but maybe not. Is she? Um, she but those are be. people who who most of our listeners don't know. So yeah, she she might be. Um, so it sounds like what I'm hearing, if if you support this this <clears throat> concept in general, one, that that healthcare is a human right, and two, we should have Medicare for all, um, educate yourself, mm-hmm. start to educate your sphere of influence mm-hmm. and talk to as many people as possible, um, start to have the conversations, and then make sure that the people who you have a say in electing who are running to represent you in our government and make this decision and hold your voice on these things Mm -hmm. are absolutely 100% committed to supporting this unwaveringly. And there's two districts we have a chance at that locally is district 15, Mm -hmm. um, which is East Hillsboro and Lakeland, like Polk County area. Mm -hmm. Um, Like we said, there's, there's no incumbent. Right. With the four candidates who we can't remember all of them. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. And Maybe then, I'll go uh, back and edit that with the right names. I can't remember what Chris's district number is, but Pinellas County, where Charlie Christ is, those are the two that we have the best chance. Um, uh, there's a possibility. I mean, there's a long shot in Pasco County with uh, um, there's a couple of Democrats running there. Uh, I think there's three. Okay. That I'm aware of. Um, I won't endorse you know any one of them except I am um, the me and my. Uh, our healthcare committee. Mm-hmm. Um, we do want to have a conversation with the representative. I mean, representative. He wishes, um, <laughs> but the candidate running called Chris Hunter. Uh-huh. Um, we had a uh, event over there in Pasco, mm-hmm. and uh, I was with Scott Shoup. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the um, progressives know he's our vice president. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, hardworking man. And uh, he told us straight to our faces that he was against Medicare for all. So we actually, I'm sure that's not the only now, did other you say issue. he was a Democrat? Well, like I said, it doesn't matter what they have on their voter registration. <laughs> it does to me. And that's why I want to know. <laughs> oh, he's, but well, he but is he, he is. running as a Democrat? Yes. Okay, yes. Yeah. Interesting. Um, okay. Yeah. And then there's another man, and I can't remember his name. I apologize. I don't live in Pasco. <laughs> um, and then also, of course, Robert Taker, um, who's, I think, sort of for it and like, a, a slower fashion than HR six seven six does. Gotcha. Is he wants a uh, Medicare extra, which is like a slower way. Like first we get what we call a public option into Medicare. Right. So you're not automatically in, in Medicare, but you can kind of buy into it. Yeah. Um, and then I haven't I haven't had a chance to talk to the other gentleman running. And but yeah, um, we don't want to have somebody. And I'm sure that's not the only issue he's against us on. Mm-hmm. If he's not for Medicare right, for all, sure. so <laughs> Valid um, we point. need some folks in Pasco County to be finding out where Chris Hunter's campaigning, and talk to him about um, Medicare for all, transportation issues, offshore offshore, dr- uh, offshore drilling issues. Um, you mean things issues. that might be built into our platform that people running mm-hmm. yeah. should should actually uphold. Don't get me started. Okay, so um, yeah, just because yeah, I, we we don't want Bilirakis there anymore. But at the same time, I mean, we we need someone who's gonna. We don't want a Bilirakis light we, either. We we need Democrats that are gonna uphold our platform. Yeah. Here are two questions that I have. So I sure. did have one listener submit a question, um, who said, "Can you address single payer versus buy-in disparity in popularity?" Which that was a mouthful to me. So I think that they mean. Do you know what buy-in disparity means? Are they talking about public option? I don't know. I guess I should have clarified. <clears throat> so that's the only thing I can think of. So um, originally Obamacare, mm-hmm. the Affordable Care Act, wanted to have, um, instead of instead of having what we, what we call the marketplaces, right. where you can go in like Florida insurance marketplace yeah. and buy a private insurance and then you get yeah. Florida Blue or uh-huh. Amer- uh, Amer Group or Cigna, right. um, you would get Medicare. Mm. You would oh, just okay. buy into Medicare, right. and um, so the difference is, is okay. that um, I mean, the difference is, is that again, you're paying for it like out of pocket, like you know, mm-hmm. um, as like you're paying for insurance, and you're just you know getting through Medicare mm-hmm. um, rather than a Medicare for all right. type single payer 
um, system where everybody's automatically covered, right? No matter how much you're paying into the system, yeah. So it's truly universal. It truly gets everybody um, the insurance that they need, and regardless of their ability to pay. Why would we want insurance for everybody? <laughs> I don't know. We have souls. <laughs> I like if you that believe answer. in souls, not necessarily <laughs> a requirement. Um, Just human, you know. And then and empathy here is compassion. the big question. I put it off to last because I know it's going to be a complicated answer. Basically, how are how are we going to pay for this? Because if you're, you're sitting here and you're not thinking about all the expenses that we pay for right now and how we waste it and, you know, how much insurance companies, you know, take off. And, you know, when I really looked at this, it actually makes everything more affordable and saves us money mm -hmm. in the long run. But in the short term, you know, to basically provide health care for everyone seems like an expensive task. So I can tell you how the kind of bill broke down. It has a little mm -hmm. payment there on how we can afford it. But what's your answer on how this would be paid for? So in the conversations that I have have had with folks, mm -hmm. um, the most fairest way that this is done is um, – um, Basically, uh, three to four uh, payers into the system, mm -hmm. so to speak. So um, you have uh, regular folks, right? So depending on how much you earn, mm -hmm. right, you pay a certain percentage. And the percentage has to be it has it can't be arbitrary it has to be dependent on how much we need in order to gotcha. to pay for everybody right I see. so they they came up you know some economists came up with mm -hmm. i think five percent for regular people yeah um six percent from 6%. what i read it they had said that if six percent of people earning over fifty five thousand mm -hmm. dollars um and then three percent for people under that if we if we impose mm -hmm. that it would pay for the entire system right. rehaul so something like that mm -hmm. so those are like the first two two groups um and then you have um different uh, uh i think it's five percent as well from employers right mm -hmm. they're already paying so much of their um expenses right so you have a third group would be employers pay just mm -hmm. like they pay part of your medicare right and social security tax right mm -hmm. um the fourth uh possible stream of funding is through different forms of taxes like through um if somebody buys an insurance plan for like any um, elective surgeries, right. like which I'm, which I'm not too familiar with, like the, those kind of insurance plans, like why would somebody need an insurance plan for elective <laughs> surgeries? Like I don't know, like uh, Botox and stuff. I guess. But I mean, it's possible. Like sure. it, it's possible that that could be a you know a profitable business where you right. um, do that. It, they might tax you know, something like that and mm -hmm. get an additional forms of funding. So those are the way the funding. So, so for, for people who are, th this is how I process that is like people who are so like, Oh no taxes. You're going to raise taxes. I want my money. But if you're an average working class person who has some kind of medical expense. Let's say, mm -hmm. again, I go back to this because I have a lot of friends that have kids who have to take ADHD medicine, mm -hmm. and that's just an easy benchmark for me to use. And you're paying four or $500 a month for this medicine, mm -hmm. it could be likely that maybe you'll pay a higher percentage of your income tax. But if you're able to, if we're able to drive down the prices of these monthly, you know, um, pharmacy bills that are so exorbitant, and we have some collective power and the price of healthcare goes down in general, mm -hmm. and you're not paying your premium each month, and then you're not paying the co-pays. And in general, your health bill I would imagine would be go down more than the percentage you would pay in taxes. So yeah. it would be a win for you, even if you're someone who's only motivated by how much money it would equate to. Yeah, um, that's exactly it. And the, okay, so if you have um, another thing to think of is you have 10% of the people in the United States, right, who don't have health insurance, mm -hmm. right? Um, a lot of those people are younger, healthy people, which mm -hmm. aren't very expensive anyway. They're right. the people who opted out of, you know, the mandate right. where you have to get insured mm -hmm. because it was, you know, they weighed the tax sure. that they would have to pay and the cost and all that, um, which is probably going to go up very, very soon mm. because we're not mandated anymore um, to get insurance. But um, so if you if you take in those people, right, mm -hmm. um, they don't really cost a lot to cover. Anyway, um, children, most children are already covered. There are a few 
um, few. There are some children who are not covered right, right. now, which would be great to have them covered. Yeah. But children don't cost a lot, and mm-hmm. um, it increases their overall health right. and co- it, it lowers their cost later on in yeah. life. Um, Duh. And then and then there's the people who are, uh, you know, falling in that hole where they don't have dependents. Um, they do have health problems that they need to get checked out, and there's two things that are going to happen, right? Some of them are going to get health insurance and they're going to be able to go to the doctor and they're going to find like cancers and stuff like that earlier mm-hmm. in stage one, right. where the cost of treating that is actually going to be much lower mm-hmm. because once they have cancer, they'll get on disability and they're going to get the insurance anyway, even right. though their outcomes are lower. Mm-hmm. So you're actually going to be saving money that way. And then you're going to have folks, um, you know, like my father who may have longer term issues, but I mean, he was 58. He only had seven years to go before he was on Medicare anyway. Right. So, um, I mean, the folks that are going to be covered are either one, they're not going to be expensive to cover at all, or they really need it. I mean, these are people, I mean, regardless of what somebody thinks about, like, you know, being poor is not a sin, mm-hmm. right? You don't, A lot of people have don't have health insurance and it's, they're not even necessarily poor. They just fall in that crack where it's hard to afford. So... It, the so cost of those people are not that much. When you say sin, you make me think of like <clears throat> Christian people. I mean, yeah. Why would Christian people care if other people got health care or Muslim and, and Jewish people too? So it's <laughs> it's all the major religion religions. And I'm sure I don't know if Buddhism believes they, in they, sin, but I don't know if they believe in the concept the sin <laughs> the same way. But uh, um but even, you know, there's humanists out there who are atheist and <laughs> humanistly. Yeah. I like that. Um, so I love all of this information that um, you've been kind enough to come and share with us. Um, to me, it's a no brainer. I don't understand why anybody, you mm-hmm. know, would be opposed to providing health care in, in any of the, you know, the most thriving, you know, um, countries that, you know, we compete with all of the modern westernized countries, uh, you know, offer some kind of universal health care because mm-hmm. they believe that, you know, having healthy citizens is a benchmark, you know, of, of the very minimum that you should offer they pay less than us. Um, on average and overall. Anyway. So I'm really hoping that anybody who's been compu- confused about this or who have thought, oh, it's such a nice idea, but it's completely unrealistic, sees that not only is it realistic, but it's actually being proposed right now and supported by a lot mm-hmm. of Democrats. So we as a people have to take a stand on this and start putting it at the forefront and saying that this is important to us and demanding it from our elected officials mm-hmm. and talking about it with everybody and making sure that everybody starts to understand that it's going to be more cost cost effective, it's going to be more beneficial, um, and that it's, you know, absolutely obtainable and, you know, that we need to be supportive of it. I know you have some actions going on. You're always inviting me to stuff. Unfortunately, <laughs> I'm pulled in a million different directions. Sorry, so, no, I haven't had a, <laughs> so I haven't had a chance to make it. But tell me about some stuff that you have coming up in case people, you know, turn off this podcast and say, aside from, you know, educating people and canvassing, how can I get involved? What can I do? What do you have coming up? So um, we have a lot of things coming up. We have uh, um, a leadership academy, which just filled up, uh, which we do every couple of months Mm -hmm. where we actually train um, organizer one-on-one. Oh. So um, a lot of folks are activists, right? Mm -hmm. And they get an invite and they really care and they show up with their signs, right? Mm -hmm. Well, this is um, just that, that next set of skills to have where, you know, you can start doing things um, and building your own circle of people who are organized around your own issues that you care about. Mm. And we call that Leadership Academy. Um, We're going to have another one coming up um, in a a couple months. This next one coming up is June 2nd. Okay. Um, Every single one of my monthly meetings, we do a training. Um, Mm -hmm. Second Thursday of every month is our Hillsborough County Healthcare Committee. Okay. And so if healthcare is an issue that you really care about, um, you're more than welcome to come out. It's second Thursday of every month at the Organized Florida office on Waters, 3105 West Water Avenues. It's right on Twin Lakes, like the big ugly building where they had all the campaigns. Like um, They had the Charlie Chris, Alan Grace, and the Pat Kemp actually had her. I have a big pile. They left a big pile of her. Um, Signs. Uh, no, no, not even signs. It's like these pamphlets or something oh. <laughs> of hers I have. I might want to, I don't know if she wants me to recycle them. <laughs> Um, but that's every second Thursday of the month. Um, so the next one is, um, I guess that would be June 14th, I think. Um, and then, so 
Um, I didn't bring a list of events with me because um, that's okay. Where can, like be, that. can people go to organize Florida? Yeah. Where can they Best go? Best place to go is um, because I don't have direct access to put it in the website. So it's always uh-huh. a little bit delayed on the actual website, okay. organizeflorida.org, uh-huh. www. But on our Facebook, um, I do have admin there. So I post it. You just go to or, uh, Facebook, organize Florida and events. And I have um, tablings coming up where we just go to events um, canvases. I have a canvas coming up on, um, June 2nd. Um, we also have, um, there's actually a national group on June 9th and at 1 PM, um, there, I think the room has a hundred people limit, mm-hmm. <laughs> but I mean, overflow is great, but mm-hmm. yeah, there's going to be, um, June 9th. It's a Medicare for all meeting mm-hmm. where they're going to, sh- they give people tasks mm. um so you just commit to five hours a month oh okay so like an hour and 15 minutes a week wow. um, and they have a specific task for you so we show up on june 9th at the robert saunders library okay near ebor mm-hmm. um but yeah just if you go to the organized florida i'm like like you said jessica there's I'm always inviting <laughs> <laughs> is there are there any gubernatorial candidates that have been mm-hmm. more attached to medicare for all or yeah. have been which which gubernatorial candidate? You want to you want to take a guess? Uh, if I had to guess, I would say it would be Andrew Gillum. Yes. But oh, he told well, me to my face. shocking surprise there. Yeah, you know he, he told he told us. Um, you know he's the same uh, you know candidate for governor mm-hmm. who said um, he's not only for fifteen dollars an hour. Mm-hmm. He's like that's the bottom. He's right. like should be for more. Yeah, um, I don't know. I don't know if Chris King or Gwen Graham or Philip Levine are for it. I but know you've, that you've Adam talked- Putnam is not. I actually asked. <laughs> I asked his campaign, but I have not had a chance to talk to the other candidates yet. Okay, that might be. I know there's a there's a debate coming up, so mm-hmm. that might be a good question to try to get whoever's in charge of that debate. That might be a good question yes, to but, get in the debate. Yeah. Um. One of the things that is uh, very important as well is Attorney General, because if it wasn't for Pam Bondi mm. um, partnering with um you know, Rick Scott to join the Mm. lawsuit to overturn the Affordable Care Act. So Attorney General, Mm -hmm. there's two that I'm aware of. I apologize if there's more. But there's two Democratic candidates Mm -hmm. who are both uh, for Medicare for All. First, um, who's been in the race the longest is um, Andrew Torrens. Um, Ryan Ryan, Ryan Torrens. Ryan Torrens. Torrens. (laughs) And um, he is gung-ho for it. Mm -hmm. Um, He actually showed up to our summit Oh, um, a nice. couple months ago, yeah. And uh, also Sean Shaw. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm guessing he is. I haven't asked him straight out, but okay. um, Sean Shaw, if I ask you and you say <laughs> no, I will be very <laughs> surprised. <laughs> well, he came to our prog- – both of them actually were at our Progressive Caucus mm-hmm. um, conference we had this weekend um, in Gainesville uh, mm-hmm. at the state level. And uh, we didn't get a lot of – uh, state candidates because they're so busy and there were mm-hmm. five other conferences going on yeah. from South Florida. So it was nice to see that both the attorney generals were there. So I would hope that they would both be have this as in their platform. Well, um, I'm sure we've run way over time, but um, I appreciate you so much for coming out. Is there anything you want to say real quick in closing on this issue or anything that you want to get out there that we haven't covered? Yeah, I want to let people know that um, – Talking to folks, um, those conversations, whether they're at the door, whether it's um, at a meeting with other people, whether it's at church, just having those conversations with people is really important because I'm telling you, I've talked to hundreds of people um, and obviously almost half of them are Republicans because, you know, I don't go to, you know, I haven't been going to the progressive (laughs) Democrat (laughs) meetings and, um, you know, People are for this, whether they're Republican or Democrat, know. the yeah. regular people. So don't be the shy voters. about it. The voters are for it. They understand it. Uh, Medicare is one of the most popular programs in the history of our country. And it just makes sense that we make it available to everybody. We're already paying for it, you know, um, with insurance. We might yeah. as well make it universal coverage. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I agree. And again, thank you so much. Um, thank you for listening to this. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, Debbie has said how you can get in touch with her. If you have any questions or any feedback for this specific podcast, you can always email me, um, Jessica Vaughn. My email is jvon 30 the number 30, at gmail.com. Um, please uh, get your friends to listen to us. Um, mm-hmm. You can find us on 
reclaimingmymind.org, or you can follow us on Facebook. Um, and I'd love to have you back and talk about this as it unfolds. Just in general, I'd like to have everyone back. These issues are so complex mm-hmm. and always changing. We want to keep people aware of it. But um, thank you again so much. And thank you for all of our listeners. And as always, have a good day or evening. Mm-hmm.